Hey there friends, Dave Flatus, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. This is a missing person edition of our program. Thank you. To get started, if you haven't heard, at the beginning of January, this coming year, 2023, myself, Harvey Pratt, Jonathan Dover from uh, the Navajo Rangers, the three of us, are going to be at a one-day conference in Golden, Colorado. If you go to the Sasquatch Outpost, Google it, Sasquatch Outpost, they are the ones that are arranging this. And uh, to have three of us in one place is remarkable. Again, Harvey uh, helped me put together Tribal Bigfoot and the Hoopa Project. He did all of the uh, forensic drawings. This is going to be a big conference because we're going to tie together a lot of things that I'm sure none of you have ever heard before. Jonathan, 30 plus years working on the Navajo Re Reservation, investigating everything paranormal. Harvey Pratt, 40 years in the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation, a Chi Cheyenne Arapaho Native, Native American chief. He'll talk to you about UFOs and Bigfoot. And me. And it is going to be good. I can't believe we got all of us together in one place at one time in Golden, Colorado, suburb of Denver, home of Coors Beer. It was the home of Coors Beer. It still is kind of, but it's a great town, great town. And uh, I know that there's still tickets available, so hopefully you can make it. So today's episode, you know that Missing 411, the UFO connection, is going to be released December 13th. As we get closer, I'm going to start connecting more dots for you. Just as I went through the process of being absolutely blown away when I discovered the connecting of the dots, it's time for you too to be connected. Now, the comments under the videos, I can't believe it. I can't believe some people are so numb to the world that they start to call me a conspiracy theorist because I'm talking about UFOs. Let me start with something, folks. What does a UFO mean? UFO means unidentified flying object. If you see something flying across the sky and you can't identify it, that is a UFO. Now, you've never heard me say uh, it's extraterrestrial or we have evidence that aliens are taking people. You have never heard me say anything like that. So don't jump to any conclusions. Now, that ship in the poster, some people claim they know who it belongs to. Some people say it, it is an extraterrestrial. I don't care. I don't care where it is. I'm just laying out some facts. And the people out there that know me know that's my specialty. I'll connect the dots and I will blow you away with facts. So just hang in there. Now, the people want to call me names, call me a conspiracy theorist. Those are just demeaning terms to turn people off to following me. If you don't want to follow me, I understand. But never been known for, cons for conspiracy theories. So let's start with the letters. First one, hey Dave, the Bible warns us that these evil fallen watchers, a.k.a. aliens, are buried under boulder fields. The reference states, quote, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness, end of quotes. What appears to have happened is that before the flood, the spots where those aliens and Samara were trapped underground or covered with boulders. Sulfur is also related to these areas. I thought it was an interesting connection, and I like people to send me interesting things. Thanks for sending that. Next letter. Hey, Dave. Many years ago, my wife and I surprised a Bigfoot along the shore of Lake George, New York. Lake George, New York is just north of Albany, New York. This lake is located in the Adirondack Mountains, a place I've written about dozens of times and with a lot of strange occurrences and a lot of missing people. I've roamed the woods for a long time, and now that I have a heightened awareness of my presence, I carry a digital recorder with me all the time. Many times I heard 
barred owls, but they don't sound just right. But hey, what do I know? I've recorded them a few times, and when I put them in the Audacity program set in the spectrogram mode, you can see that the sound looks like, and it always has been a flat line. I got curious and recorded some real barred owls off YouTube with the same recorder and compared them to what I got in the woods. It is a totally different image and has an up and down aspect to it. However, the engineer in me said that, that was interesting, but an ideal situation would be to get them both, the Bigfoot imitation and the real one, all on the same day with the same equipment. Well, that day came last December when I was out hunting. I no sooner had gotten to my watch when an owl sounded off in the distance and was immediately answered by another much closer. That alone is not uncommon since that warning has happened to me many times. When I look at the images, they've always been flatliners. However, this time was different. The first was a flatliner, the second one was a real owl. Many other flatliners answered after the real one. So finally, a test subject and controlled subject within seconds. Thought you might be interested. I'm very interested. And here's why. That's science. That's evidence. That's fact. Now, Ron Moorhead, when he was up at the Sierra camp in Missing 411 The Hunted, I talked about what he recorded. He sent those recordings to a university and he wanted to know if those were in the realm of human or not human. And Ron came up that <clears throat> it was not human. So what was it? We can't say exactly what it was, but it wasn't anything in the known animal kingdom. And as this man just explained, if you have a recording of a barred owl and you record something else that sounds like it, but it's not a barred owl, well then what is it? Well, if you go back and you listen and you pay attention to my Bigfoot 101 classes, you'll notice that I, I have many quotes in there about what Native American tribes have stated about Bigfoot and their ability to mimic almost anything in the woods. Hmm, wow, Dave, I didn't know that. All right got to pay attention and you got to have an open mind to listen to some of the people that live around these things. Next letter. Hey Dave, my, my name is Caitlin. I'm 30 years old, married with three children. I've been watching your videos for some time and was also introduced to your books in my early 20s by my grandmother. Well, God bless your grandmother. I've enjoyed your work for years. About four years ago, around the age of 26, I was asleep in my bed, sleeping like usual. I woke up randomly that night, sat up, and noticed a bright blue and purple ball of light in my room. In my room, I have a big bed. Then about three feet at the bottom of my bed, there's a big dresser with a mirror attached. When I say up, I was pointed directly at the dresser in the mirror, so that's where my eyes naturally went to. While I was looking at this ball, I noticed the two colors were moving inside and around it, like smoke tumbling through the air, but staying within it. It was the size of a grapefruit. The two colors were so vibrant within itself, it, it, but it did not illuminate my room at all. It was hovering about two feet above the counter of the dresser right in front of the mirror. I noticed it had a reflection in the mirror also. My room was in the basement of my home with no source of light. I kept rubbing my eyes over and over while staring at it. When all of a sudden it shot straight for me, it scared me so bad. I tried to hit it out of the air like one would hit a bug, but I noticed my hand and went right through it. That scared me even more so. I threw myself backwards into my bed and covered my head as fast as possible. Keep in mind, my husband was in bed the entire time and didn't even flinch. By the time I got the nerve to look, it was gone. The, exper the experience has boggled my mind for years. It's natural for my brain to try and make sense of things, but I just can't make any sense of this. What did it want? What was it? Why, did it? why did I wake up? Why did it try to scare me? The list goes on. I think about it almost every day. I've also had other crazy things happen in my life. I invested in a monocular night vision setup and I've recorded some out of this world stuff. Maybe I'll wait to you another time and explain some of that. Anyways, 
Thank you for being you. I think you're a beautiful person. You're one of the few that strive to be better through every stage of life. Even when things in life are wretched, you still find a way to be better than you. I look up to you as a teacher, a mentor, and I hope one day I can shake your hand and tell you thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. The explanation you gave of that orb is perfect compared to the dozens and dozens of people I've interviewed that explain orbs. The best explanation I've ever had from some from a pair of people that were ultra credible, I've, I've explained this before, I'll explain it again, is I was, at the time I was married to somebody else, and my wife and I, my wife worked for a very big electronics company, and the president or the CEO of the company liked us a lot. He had a private jet, and uh, it was holiday time, and we, were, we had a trip going to Hawaii, flying commercial, and he invited us to go on his plane, very nice plane, from Monterey to Hawaii. And uh, got on the plane, and uh, he knew, you know, I was a policeman at the time, and he knew I was an inquisitive sort, and he said, hey, Dave, there's a third seat between the pilots. You can sit there and f the whole time if you want and talk to the pilots and fly with them and see what it's like from the cockpit. I thought, oh, my God, yes. So uh, the kids were in the back of the plane with my wife, and uh, they had a video set up where the kids could watch any kind of video they wanted. It, it was unbelievable. And they had catered meals for us all the time. I, it was so over the top, I couldn't believe it. But anyhow, I get in the cockpit, and I figure, hey, this is my one chance to talk to these guys. And they were super open, really, really great, great guys. And... Uh, we took off and we're flying and uh, I asked the guys, I said, hey, <coughs> you guys have a lot of experience. You have anything, ever seen anything weird up here? And they both looked at each other and go, let's tell them. So they both felt comfortable with me and they said, yeah, we were leaving Monterey Airport and we're heading to Maui. And we just started to pull up and gain elevation over Monterey Bay. And out of nowhere, this this ball comes right up over the passenger's, the co-pilot's seat just outside his window. They said it might have been five or ten feet max outside the window. He says, now Dave, you got to remember, <laughs> we're going about 180 miles an hour, quickly getting to 200 and 220. And this thing is just, it's like it's glued on a rod outside our window. It's not, it's not moving at all, but staying with us perfectly. And he said that the, it was about the size of a basketball. Both of them said this. They said they both looked at it, and they said that there was like plasma moving inside it, and it had a defined line around it. And they said they'd never seen anything like it before. I think they said, said it stayed with them for five minutes. And... And then he said it just jetted away. I asked him, I said, what'd you guys make of that? These two pilots, one of them was a fighter pilot in the Air Force before he became this, and the other guy was like 15 year private pilot, commercial rating in jet. He said, Dave, <laughs> I have no idea. But he says, we both saw it. We'll both swear to it. And it's just one of those things in life that those two gentlemen will never forget. It was one of the highlights of that flight. <laughs> I didn't say anything until I got off the, off the plane with my uh, ex and kids are in bed that night. And I said, you will not believe what those pilots told me. <laughs> so anyhow, that's my story with an orb from ultra credible sources. Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm finally getting the nerve to send this to you. I'm sorry in advance if it's a bit lengthy. Just want to say right off the bat how much you've contributed in my life and how thankful I am of you even though we've never met. It's funny, anytime I go out hiking or anything really, I always ask myself, what would Dave do? Ha ha. And it honestly leads me to a more responsible decision not to take chances when it comes to my safety. Okay. 
You never take chances with your safety when you're alone in the woods. You always have to have backup. You always got to have a partner. You always should be with a partner in the woods. Always. You have the aura of a true father, so much that it translates through your videos. You are truly in my thoughts, and I'm so sorry about Ben. He was incredibly lucky to have you, and I just know, see through your eyes. I was the lucky one in that. Last year, 2021, around Mother's Day, my boyfriend and I went camping in this remote area to celebrate it. I don't have kids, but I'm a mother of a husky, and it's a joke that we celebrate Mother's Day for me, huh? just for any reason to go camping. Well, a couple days prior, I was reading up on fairies and on a spot when you're in the proximity of them. I was reading stories from folklore from different cultures and their characteristic actions described. Stealing things from people, them being tricksters, and to always make offerings to them to avoid their discrepancies, they're usually located in cave roots of trees that seem to be unusual for the area. Well, we found a camping spot, got set up by nightfall. Why did we arrive and set up at night? Because we are danger seekers, ha ha. We just like traveling at night and it's peaceful. So I didn't know my surroundings till morning light. To my surprise, alongside our tent, I see a tree that fits the description of what the Fae would live. Had a large rock in front of this willow looking tree, short, and under the rock is a hole going deep. Realistically, I thought it's clearly, probably just an animal living there. But the tree itself was unusual, a short willow tree surrounded by redwoods. I told my boyfriend my thoughts and we chuckled together. I made an offering to them and I put something sweet on the rock and some nuts and we chuckled together and kept it real lighthearted. So, what the Native Americans say is you leave some tobacco for them. That night I was in my tent my boyfriend was putting the fire out. He came back in and joked that he had urinated on that tree rock. For some reason I got serious and told him he shouldn't have done that. My boyfriend took my seriousness as a joke and he laughed while getting ready for bed. He took off his expensive watch and put it near his pillow. Why he took off his watch? I have no clue. By accident, possibly, but morning we woke up, made breakfast, and took down our tent, and his watch was gone. I laughed to myself because I know Faze like to take shiny things and be tricksters when you insult them. Dave, we looked everywhere, all over that campsite, every crevice in the truck, under it, and all our personal belongings, even tracing back our hiking trail just in case. Everywhere was truly eerie. I told him to make an offering or something of equal value of the watch, something shiny perhaps, before we leave and apologize. He was so dumbfounded and desperate by the disappearance, he did what I requested and left a shiny whistle, three chocolate chip cookies, nuts, and apologize. Okay, the cookies would have died for me. We left the campsite without the watch. A week and a half later, I was walking him to his car as he went to work one early morning. As we were saying goodbye, something shiny caught my eye in his car. In the cup holder, there was his watch from the remote campsite. We were stunned, speechless. I asked if he's trying to play some kind of trick on me, and he was thinking of the same about me. We reassured each other it had nothing to do with each other joke-related. Dave, I'll tell you, he became a believer that morning. He was talking about it for weeks after, now safe to say he has more respect for the entities than he ever did before. I've, searched, I've heard similar stories many times. So thanks for that. Another one. This was before I knew anything about missing 411 or the things you've taught us villagers. So please brace yourself for some of my idiotic decisions. The what would Dave do was not in effect at the time. My anniversary, my boyfriend took us and my husky dog to Sequoia Forest to camp, a dispersed area, so where we can be as far away from everyone off trail. You had to have been in Sequoia National Forest because you can't take a dog into a national park, just to let everybody know. We parked my truck and hiked in for a while until we found a great spot. Let me describe the area briefly. Trees everywhere, but not condensed. It was a it was redwood then, six feet then redwood. So I can see through the woods for a long distance, no bushes or thick brush at all. Just tree, space, tree. And ever since we found the spot, I have this unnatural feeling like I'm being watched. My chest has been tight since we left that truck. 
My boyfriend assured me it was just to do the high elevation since we were thousands of feet high. So that gave me some br very brief peace. The spot we found was about 25 to 30 minutes from the truck. Once at the spot, my boyfriend said he forgot something important in the truck and he wants to go get it for me while I wait there. I was confused and nervous. I didn't want to wait there by myself. What well, if there's a bear or something, you know? Not that we carried any bear mace, bear spray. Dumb decision. Nor any type of GPS locator in case we got lost. Dumb decision number two. So somehow I offered to go for him like that made the situation better for me. It didn't. Dumb decision number three. But nonetheless, he agreed. Me and my husky started walking, and I keep looking back at my boyfriend until we turned the path, and I didn't see him behind me anymore. So my chest starts feeling like 30 pounds of concrete. My head is in a constant swivel and feel some comfort in that because I can see very far through the trees because there's no bushes. Just tree space tree. I keep walking and I stop because the feeling of something watching me is strong. The second I stop walking, my husky stop, stopped, looked to our left, and puffed up. Stop right there. Dogs are the key indicator in these. If your dog starts acting strange, you start paying attention. That's why when Angie and I go out, Hawk's always with us. And to this day, she's never acted weird on a hike. She has acted very weird around our house, and our house is in the woods. So, yeah, I pay attention. Uh, very weird thing happened this morning. I'm usually the first one up. I take her outside, and there's, there's some big piles of snow around our house. She likes to get up on top of the piles of snow and just dig like a mad woman. And uh, she was digging. And all of a sudden, and I'm standing right next to her and I'm looking at her. And all of a sudden she just stops digging. And she picks her head up abruptly and just looks in the same direction I'm looking over the top of her. And she's frozen. And she's just staring. And there's nothing out there that I can see. And then like a second and a half after she turns and looks, she jumps. And Great Pyrenees have an ability, even if they're down on their stomach on all fours, they have the strange ability to just jump sideways three feet at a time. And it's part of that inherent ability to, to fight and get away from predators. And she jumped about three feet it's like something touched her, even though, and I thought that at the time. And I didn't see anything around us. Nothing touched me. And then I stepped over close to her and I said, hey, it's okay. And she calmed down a little bit, but I've never seen her do that. It was freaky. It's about 7.30 in the morning. About 17 degrees outside. Okay, so onto the story. The second I stopped walking, my husky stopped, looked to our left and puffed up. She doesn't do this unless something's real. Not like a squirrel, you know. I'm searching where she goes looking and nothing. I tug down the leash to say, come on, let's go. She's puffed up the entire time. Walking now like whatever is walking parallel to us, she stopped me again and went low to the ground, puffed up. I got scared. I can feel something there in my gut, but I can't see it. Nothing. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And I was thinking that way this morning. The anxiety was intense and I did a test. I stopped walking and led my husky quickly, like sprinted briefly towards the opposite way where my boyfriend was waiting. My husky's head kept looking behind us, which told me whatever it was didn't expect my change in direction swiftly. Now I'm a bit in a panic mode, Dave. I stopped walking and watched my husky head follow from where I sprinted from to where my current position. Something is following us. Another thing, not one sound. Since I left my boyfriend, not one. No birds, Dave, nothing. I was going to run back to my boyfriend, but I was already too far and closer to my truck. I hope. I looked around once more and I see nothing, just dead silence. My eyes were getting watery now. I camp all the time and I've never felt this before in my life. 
the silence, the anxiety, the fear, the heavy energy, the feeling of being watched, my gut telling, get out of here. Dumb decision. I ran. We ran as fast as we could. So let's, let's talk about this for a second. You can't outrun anything that's a danger to you in the woods. You got that? No, you can't. You can't outrun a bear. You can't outrun a, run a mountain lion. You can't outrun a moose, elk, deer. So why run? Just think about that. The hairs on the back of my head were standing up as I ran. I felt like I was going nowhere fast. The side of my truck in the far distance seemed like a mirage. I got the keys from my jacket while running, which made me trip over my own feet, and I fell. My dog stopped running immediately and looked around really quick while I was on the floor, and I watched my husky stop panting. Yeah, the dog's going, get up. And the air pulled up again, looking to the left of us again into the trees. Are you kidding me? What is this? Why is it happening? I get up and sprinted even faster to the truck, and I got in, locked the doors, and started crying. I couldn't call my boyfriend due to no cell reception. I wasn't going to leave the car, no way. I just started honking the horn in the hopes that my boyfriend would hear me. Eventually, I see him come out of the path with a worried look on his face. He got to the car, and I told him what happened. I begged him to leave, that it was a nice anniversary gesture, but I just want to go back to where you... And if he paid me, he agreed and we left the desolate area as fast as I could while still crying. I was a mess, but something was out there. Something was there. I felt it in my bones, a primal fear, a primal warning of danger. Haven't been there since, told my friend about my experience and he joked saying, could have been 411. I was confused and he referred me to look you up, Dave, and the rest is history. Ha ha. Never miss a video. So, when you're in the truck, and let's say you're out of range for him to hear the honk of the horn, well, you got to get in this wavelength with your partner. Now, Angie and I both carry guns, and we know that if we get separated for some reason, someone's going to fire off three rounds. And that's going to tell us, you come to them. They aren't going to move. And in that case, where you're, when you're at the truck, if your boyfriend couldn't have heard the horn, you got a gun, fire off three rounds, and he knows you're in trouble and he'll come. That's another reason why you carry a gun. It's a great, great tool to notify people where you're at. And please, if, you're gonna, if you've never carried a gun, Go to a range and take formal lessons. And they have guns there and they will teach you about the different types of pistols. And when you find a pistol that you're comfortable with and you can shoot accurately, then you go out and buy one. Don't go buy a pistol first and then hope it's good for you. That's a waste. Hey, next letter. Hey Dave, I'm a longtime listener. I've been watching you for years on YouTube. I cannot begin to tell you the despair that I share with you. I cry right along with you. Many of us do. I mean, I literally cry with you. I have prior military experience. I know you say that the army is the worst force to join if one had a chance, but it was my choice. I'm telling you of a very strange orb that I've never seen before in my apartment. I have four cameras in my apartment just for the orb activity and to monitor maintenance men that come in here. My cameras recorded a very strange orb it flashed three times before disappearing and just before I turned my bedside lamp on. I'm a medical records tech, as that's what I did in the Army. I don't know what the orb is, but it's still here and I'm still recording. For the facts you supply us with, thank you and thanks for just being you. You looked wonderful and happy at the premiere. Keep going, Dave. We love you. Thank you very much. You know, every morning I get up, <clears throat> say to myself, I've told you guys this before, I'm not going to be mediocre today. I'm going to try to do what others won't do. I'm, I'm going to try to excel 
and be better than the next person. I try, I try hard every day. I may not meet that. And I know I can't make everybody happy. And that's an unrealistic goal. But I also know that there's a lot of smart people in this village that understand what I go through because you've gone through it too. And that friendship and that bond, I'm greatly appreciative. Thank you. So, the stories today are really important. <clears throat> well, Dave, why are they important? Because if you start to miss some of these stories that I'm telling you, you're not going to be able to put together the facts in a cogent way and understand really what's going on. But you're going to get a big dose of it right now. First story I'm going to tell you about was in Missing 411 Law. And it involved a hunter, a man named Craig Gimon, 47 years old, missing October 6, 1966, 1996, in the Gross Venture Wilderness in Wyoming. He lived in Cody. And on October 6, he was hunting with friends in an area just east of Soda, Soda Lake in Pinedale. If you've never been to Pinedale, you need to go. The mountains just east of Pinedale are some of the most beautiful, rugged in the world. <laughs> great fishing, great hunting, a lot of spookiness. <laughs> a lot. So, he's on horseback and he's hunting with a friend and he dismounts his, his horse and he takes a shot at an elk. Elk again. And he thought he hit it. So they lost sight of the elk and the guys separate to look for it. So he's on the ground looking for the elk. His horse is tied up. He's got his rifle. He's in grizzly bear territory. Well, his friend started looking for the elk and then pretty soon started looking for Craig because he can't find him. And that was strange because he had a rifle and they know they'll fire three rounds if they're in danger or they can't find each other and his partner's firing rounds and nobody's answering. And he gets the rest of his friends and they start searching and they search all the way until late in the night of October 6th. So they thought, well, We'll just stay in camp tonight. And he'll, maybe he's out there and he'll come in. He didn't come in. So on the early in the morning of October 7th, the hunting party contacts the Teton County Sheriff, who has the jurisdiction in that area. And immediately the sheriff puts a plane up and he gets eight ground pounders, people on foot and on horseback, to go into that area looking for Craig. Now, his friends told him that Craig had hunted this area many times in the past, and the idea that he was lost wasn't reasonable. So, the first day, they come up with nothing. The next day, they put out canine units and more people, and the canine went out first, and then the ground pounders went out. Well, just about 11 a.m. on October 8th, second day of the search. Searchers on foot, a mile from the location where Craig was last seen, just a mile, they come across Craig and his body near the bottom of a tree. Pay close attention, friends, really close attention. Let me quote to you what the sheriff stated. We are pretty certain he fell out of a tree, but don't know what he was doing there. A tree was 40 foot high, and they said he was near the top of the tree when he fell. Sheriff went on to say, maybe he was scared and went up there to sleep. He said a bear may have chased him, but there's no indication that there was a bear in the area. Sheriff is scratching 
for an explanation that the public will accept. Because they knew the evidence they had in front of them was perplexing at best. Hang in there. So what they found, well, the, the sheriff went on to say it, it looked like he was up in that tree all night. Why would Craig go up in a tree? He had a rifle. You're a hunter. If a bear was chasing you, you turn around and shoot the bear. You're not going to, and friends, listen to me carefully, you're not going to outclimb a bear up a tree. If that bear wants you, that bear's going to get you. And hunters know this. Now, Craig's boots, his hat, his belt, and other things were still in the tree. Candy wrappers, raisins, and a trail of trash were under the tree and followed a path that they thought he fell in out of the tree. Does this make any sense to you? So his boot, his coat, his hat, and his belt are all up in the tree. Autopsy revealed several broken bones, including a femur. Femur is between the hip and the knee. You're not going anywhere with a broken femur. And the sheriff made a point of saying that wasn't the cause of death, his broken bones. But the coroner said he died of hypothermia, something we've talked about hundreds of times right here on this channel. Facts. One boot was found in the tree, one boot found on the ground. So that means he didn't fall and the boots came off. The boots were off before he hit the ground. Now, after he hit the ground, they say that he crawled some distance. They also stated that they searched the area in a wide region and never found his rifle. So, why would Craig stay in a tree for two days? Think about that. Because that's how long he was missing. Corner stated he was a very healthy man, no mental, mental illness issues. He's a graduate of the University of Utah. He's an electrician. Very smart, his friend stated. Now he knew this area very well. He had hunted it many times. Why not just walk to Soda Lake where they were right near and find your way out? Why not walk back to his partner? His friends searched that night, fired off rounds. Why didn't he respond coming back? There's no reason for dropping out of a tree. Now, one thing the sheriff said in many of the articles is that it was their belief that Craig tied himself in the tree with his belt. Now, he was a religious man. He was a Mormon. He was located about two miles east of Soda Lake. Canines never found him. Ground pounders found him. Now, when I read this case, friends, I nearly fell out of my chair. Because, I'll tell you in a second. Make sure I got a map where this happened. So this is Pinedale, Wyoming right here. This is Soda Lake. This is the area east of Pinedale. This is very wild very remote wilderness area. Thousands and thousands of small lakes in this area. What I've always stated is people will disappear more often in this environment than in any other environment you can imagine. So he was just east of this location up in this area. I have a very good friend named Reuben 
Uriarty. He's a, a director of MUFON in California. And he wrote a book, a great book, called Aliens in the Forest, The Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. He and Noe Torres wrote it. Really good book. I'll show you the picture. Ruben and Noe on the back. Ruben's one of the most credible investigators I've ever been around. His work is impeccable. And I've known about, I've known Ruben for probably 20 years. Now this book deals with a man who went hunting in Cisco Grove off Highway 80 between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe. It's a prime corridor going from North Lake Tahoe and Reno to Sacramento. Area has tons of water, has tons of lakes, just like Pinedale's area. Pretty remote back in the area where this incident happened. So it's the fall of 1964, and a man named Donald Shrum, S-H-R-U-M, he was employed by a U.S. military missile manufacturer at the time. He liked to hunt the Sierras, Sierras, and on September 4, 64, when this incident happened, he was 26 years old. He drove to Cisco Grove to hunt with some friends. And let me read to you, and I've, I talked to Reuben before this, and he said, Dave, read anything you want out of here. So I'm going to read to you a bit. On the evening of September 4, 64, about two hours after climbing a pine tree in the Tahoe National Forest near Cisco Grove, where he intended to spend the night, Shroom observed a strange light moving slightly below the top of the nearby ridge located north of his position. The object moved to below the tree line. At first, the light appeared to be a flashlight or lantern bobbing up and down in the sky and moving from east to west. It formed a distinct orb and did not blink or radiate any outward beams. As Shroom continued watching, he thought that perhaps the light was a helicopter dispatched from a nearby U.S. Forest Service station. Maybe his two friends had reported him missing and had convinced the park rangers to mount a helicopter search. Perhaps the light in the sky was a helicopter searching for him, employed by the rangers. Not wishing to miss the chance of being rescued, he decided to make his presence known to the approaching airship. Excitedly, he climbed down from the perch of the tree, gathered dry brush, and using matches he always carried with him, lit signal fires atop of three large rocks located near the base of the trees. Smart thing. So he was, he was lost. Friends couldn't find him. Moving forward in the story, a shroom continued to observe the mothership hovering over a canyon with its three rectangular lighted panels or windows. A very unusual thing happened. Quote, I sat there and watched it. It must have been four or five minutes or so, and then something came out of the second panel. And all I could see was a kind of a flash. Something went straight down the hill, shroom said. Well, that's highly unusual. Soon it became clear to the witness that the second object was a small UFO, which we'll refer to as a scout ship. Shroom called it a module. So he sees a big ship come in, a little ship leaves, starts to come down towards the ground. So Shroom sees what he calls humanoids coming down through the forest towards him. a picture of the humanoids that uh, Ruben put in the book. Really good work. Good drawings. The whole thing is quality. The first creature stepped about 100 feet northwest of Shroom's position and seemed to be studying and gathering samples from a manzanita bush nearby. Shroom said it came within, I guess, oh, 100 feet, stopped, and began messing around with the tree. I don't know what it was doing or looking or what it wasn't doing, and then it joined by another one just like it. The creature seemed to be intensely curious about their surroundings. Shroom described his initial reaction and appearance of the UFOs and humanoids as pure panic. 
He was scared to death of what he was seeing. His lifelong indifference about UFOs ended immediately, and he saw two unearthly figures moving around in the brush near the tree. It was now 11 p.m. and midnight, waking up at the dry leaves and receiving the first dose of white vapor. Shroom knew that his relaxed, detached observation of the events going on around him was over. The war had been declared. So what happened? Mr. Shroom is in a tree. He sees these things walking towards him. He goes up further in the tree. He goes up further in the tree till near, near the top. And they're trying to get him out of the tree. And finally what they do is they release some gas up into the tree towards him at the top of the tree. Quote this, this is from the book. After I moved up to the top of the tree, I took my military belt and moved it out to the last hitch and put it around me in the tree so that in, that in case I did get gassed, I wouldn't fall down. The simple move to doubt, turned out to be extremely crucial in his survival on this most, most frightful of nights. Friends. <laughs> I had never told Reuben or anyone about the Craig Gimon case. It was a very unknown case with very little publicity when Reuben wrote this book. I nearly fell out of my chair when I wrote, read the research here. So, Shroom goes to the top of the tree, takes his belt, puts it around the tree and him so in case he goes unconscious, he doesn't fall out of the tree and get killed. As would supposedly happen with Gimon. So these entities release the gas. He goes to sleep. He doesn't remember anything. He wakes up. They're gone. They tried to get him out. They couldn't get him out. And they couldn't figure out how to get up the tree. And he survived to tell the story. Shroom stayed in the tree and lived. Gimon fell to the ground and died. 32 years between incidents, both hunters, both were alone. A UFO was seen, multiple UFOs were seen before Donald Shroom saw any of these entities approach him. The commonalities in the shroom Guillaume incident are impeccably, unbelievably close. Now, you can ignore both stories, but if you read the articles associated with Craig Guillaume, the sheriff, nobody can explain what he was doing in that tree. Nobody can explain why he had to remove his clothes and his boots. I still don't understand. So, you have a couple of data points here. Remember, I stated before that when I've done the research and people, I found many people have fallen, been dropped, etc. Here's another data point for you. Gimon fell. But, why hypothermia? Why would he take his boots off? Why would he take his coat off? Why would he not just get out of the tree and walk back to his camp? Why? He'd only been in that tree for two days. Why stay in the tree? Why? Well, let me tell you about another incident in very close proximity to the Cisco Grove incident. So if, you've if you don't know, here's Cisco Grove. This is Highway 80. This is Lake Tahoe. This goes on to Reno right over in here. This goes down into, this goes down into Sacramento over in here. A little place called Selby Flat. It's about 30 air miles 
from Cisco Grove. Why am I telling you about that? Another very interesting book that somebody out there sent me that I'm greatly appreciative of. This is the book. And it was edited and put together by Chauncey Canfield, a minor in the time. The author uh, was a diary written by a man named Alfred Jackson. And it was found by Chauncey, edited and published. And the book has a very interesting story in it. December 25th, 1851, during the splurge of gold and the 49er gold rush in the Sierras in Selby Flat, there were two miners named Ristein and Carter. Well, they invited Chauncey, I correct that, they invited Alfred Jackson, the writer, to come to their cabin with some other miners and have dinner Christmas night. 1851. They had a good time. And at the end of the night, everybody left, went back to their own camp. Well, on January 7th, a man, a man named Harry Shively went to the cabin to check on Ristine and Carter because they hadn't heard from him in almost two weeks. And as he approached the cabin, the door to the cabin was open, which wasn't normal. And he went inside. And he found a moldy can of beans hanging above the fire, a sack of flour on the ground that had been bitten into him and flour was spread around probably by rats. Shively walked to the, their nearby gold claim and everything seemed to be as normal. Tools were in place, but Shively noticed that the shovels were rusty and hadn't been used for seven to 10 days. He got nervous. So he went back towards town and got friends and he returned to the cabin. Well, the friends and Shively found uh, Ristine's and Carter's shotgun and rifle hanging above the fireplace, just like they'd always been there. There was a six shooter under the pillow of one of the men's cot. And there was, there didn't appear any intention anyone was leaving. It just seems like the door was open and boom, they were both gone. It was the opinion by the people in the community that the two men hadn't been there in seven to 10 days. Well, they checked Selby flat and nobody had seen the men either since Christmas. So the men went back and they got a search party of 20 people. And one mile uphill from the men's cabin, they found Ristine's body under some manzanita bushes. It was stated that coyotes had torn off both arms of Ristine. They found his watch laying on the ground. They got a corner. He came out. And the final verdict was that Ristine died of unknown circumstances with an unknown cause of death. Neither arm was found, but they thought that it was just carried away by the coyotes. The coroner went back to the cabin and they found a buckskin satchel with $800 in gold dust inside under one of the beds. There was a box under another bunk with three years of gold powder filling various glass jars. They found out that both men were married. They both came from Pennsylvania out to the 49er gold fields. One, came, one man came from Reading, Pennsylvania. Another man came from Pittsburgh. And here's the weird, weird part. There was nothing taken from the cabin. Nobody could figure out anything was taken. No suspicion of robbery. The general opinion was Carter was dead somewhere for some reason, but they didn't know where and they couldn't find him. The questions to ask was, this is in the winter time, in the Sierras, there's no way the men would have left the door open if they were gonna be gone any period of time. If there was a threat outside, 
say there was a bear trying to take down the front door of the cabin. Well, the rifle and shotgun wouldn't have been there. It would have been in their hands. So 60 days after this incident, Carter's remains are found at the head of a place called Myers Ravine, about one mile from their cabin. The body had been gnawed clean by bears and coyotes. They found the shirt, overalls and boots, and they found a knife, a pipe, and tobacco pouch belonging to Carter. And the people said that he always had it with him. Now you might think, well, maybe these guys killed each other because they were mad at each other. There's no evidence of that. There's none. And everyone said that these guys got along great. All of their gold was in the same place that it's always been. Now the book, the, and the diary that was written by Alfred Jackson, says at the time that there was no scenario that fit the situation of Carter and Ristine disappearing. None. Now it's 30 miles from there to Cisco Grove. We know that these incidents involving 411 have gone on for decades. What would cause two men to leave their cabin in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the winter? Simultaneously. And leave the door open. Or did one man leave, not come back, and the other man started to look for him? But if that was the case, he wouldn't have left the door open to the cabin. Think about that. A lot of scenarios here at play. They said that the cabin was not ransacked. There was no evidence that anyone had wanted to take anything from the cabin. There was no evidence of anyone wanting to take their gold. There was no evidence that the men were together. They were each a mile apart and one mile from the cabin. And one was found in a ravine that had a creek flowing through it. The other man was found uphill under a manzanita bush a mile away. So what's with the one mile? Both were found equidistant from the cabin. I find that odd. Very odd. Now at this time, in 1851, in California, they had grizzly bears. And I get that, and I thought about that the whole time. But these men were smart. They lived in that environment. They knew the dangers. If a danger existed, they would have left the cabin with one of the guns. Each had their own gun. And the pistol was under one of their pillows. What's that? I know sometimes when I have a slight feeling that something might go wrong, I'll grab a pistol and <clears throat> carry it with me wherever I go, which is most of the time. But these men, they didn't carry their pistol and they didn't carry their rifles. And $800 in gold dust in just that one bunk is a whole heck of a lot of money in 1852. So whatever happened here is very, very odd. Last thing. The book and the articles that were written never said anything about any bear tracks seen around the cabin, any drag marks around the body, any special depredation of the bodies that could be identified and specifically the coroner stated that he didn't know the cause of death important so friends i talked to you about some pretty heavy cases here 
Two cases within 30 miles of each other. Another case in Pinedale, Wyoming, that should have you really shaking your head hard. And comparing that to the Shrum case in Cisco Grove, I don't know how you can ignore these things. And think about this. Shrum's to Shrum told this story when it happened, back in the 60s. Craig's case happened in 96, and the facts are almost identical. And I'm just giving you the facts. You come up with the opinion. I appreciate you being here. <clears throat> when you go out today, do something nice for someone. Just a small gesture of good faith. And lastly, you do me a big favor by posting this on your social media. Let other people know what's going on. Because I'm sure within a couple months, these cases are going to be on everyone's website and they're going to be saying, oh, I made this comparison. <laughs> That's so frustrating. Anyhow, I'm blessed that you're friends. Make sure you're still subscribed to our channel. You can follow me on Twitter, David Politis, I can't am missing. And I'm also a true social, same place. Thank you. Missing 411, the UFO connection, December 13th. Politis out.